He dug a, a wine press. It's dug in rock. Off of this uh, made of lumber and sitting on top of the ground. And you, you've seen these things with a with a, a, a an auger kind of thing that presses down on the grapes and, and then squeezes the juice out and so on. You've seen those in uh, in uh, museums, no doubt. But he was so careful that he that he built this in stone so it would always be there. And I'm told that in the Holy Land, in many places, particularly in the hill country, you can find those old vats still in place. That people dug them out for uh, for the squeezing, the trampling of the of the grape uh, to to uh, make it useful. So God did did all that. Then he built a tower, a watchtower, so that the people could uh, observe and, and guard the inheritance and make sure that their crop was unmolested. And then he rented it out to vine growers. He had planted the vines. They were of a particular uh, vintage, and, uh, and they had, they had uh, the variety that would produce the fruit that he desired. What was interesting in Isaiah's account is that when the harvest came from this vineyard, they were wild grapes. Uh, we used to call them Mustang grapes. Uh, they grow out in the turn rows of the fields, and uh, they were never very palatable. And sometimes people would, would gather them and try to make something useful out of them, and it would take so much sugar until it was an uphill task. Uh, but these were wild grapes. Some of you are familiar uh, with that part of the world. But in this case, Jesus was expecting a good crop of grapes, and when the harvest time came, he sent servants to gather his share. Have any of you ever lived on a farm that did not belong to you? I'm not saying that, that, that you are uh, uh, in, were, were there in a wrong way, but you had an agreement with the landowner that when harvest time came that he would get a share of your crop. We used to rent a farm in deep east Texas. And we rented it on the basis of the thirds and fourths. Uh, feed crops received one percentage, and a cotton crop received another. And the landowner would claim that much from the gin and so on. Some of you, I see Mary not your head, she knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so, so this was the way the rent was collected. Once a year, at harvest time, uh, the landowner that would then would receive his share from the crop. This is what Jesus structured uh, in me. That he rented out to vine growers and then expected them to uh, surrender the landowner's portion at the harvest time. Let's uh, extend that just a moment. Suppose that our Lord was saying to us, you live in my, on my property. Uh, I have not deeded it to you. It does not belong to you. Not any portion of it belongs to you. It still belongs to me. But I expect you at harvest time to give me my share in full. And you know what these wicked men did? God expects fruit from the vineyard. Verse 34, look at it with me. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The messengers of God have been shamefully abused. Do you suppose the Lord was talking about his prophets? Do you suppose the, the Lord was talking about the judges that he sent? Do you suppose the, talk, the Lord was talking about the many messengers that came expressing the will of God for the people? And rather than listen
listening to them and heeding them and responding to the messages that they brought. The people treated them with abuse. And in this case, the vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned the third. Would you allow me to extrapolate from that? That's a good word, isn't it? I like those big words once in a while. I think I understand them somewhat. But would you allow me to expand on that and suggest that in our gospel church, sometimes Christian people are beaten. Sometimes Christian people abuse their privilege. Sometimes people are uh, painfully guilty of doing things and saying things that are unkind. May I suggest to you one way to reduce the talk in this church and other churches is for people to ask, first, first of all, is this the gospel truth? Is it absolutely true? That would eliminate a lot of people. Because sometimes gossip gets going and people don't even know or care whether it's true or not. The second thing is, is what I'm going to say kind? The Bible says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, because Christ has forgiven you. Is it kind? And the third condition that I would suggest is, is it really necessary? I would like to see change in the mentality of our church, our congregation. I would like to see our people, when they hear somebody rumbling about something that is really none of their business in the first place, that they simply say, I do not want to hear that, and walk away. I think if the audience is removed, the rumor dies. Did you hear that? If the audience is removed, the rumor dies. Just like if drug addicts are no longer available, the drug industry dies. The illicit drug industry, if you will. And I think that we have control not only of what we say, but what we gleefully listen to. I don't know whether you can take all this from this parable or not, but I think it's true, don't you? And I think unless we learn this lesson and learn it quickly, that we will be paying a great and horrible price. Again, he sent another group of slaves, larger than the first. And they did the same thing to them. Jesus, the landowner. Jesus, who owned the vineyard. Jesus, who never gave up title. Not to you, not to me, not to anybody. This church does not belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. And unless we carefully and lovingly deal with it according to his wisdom, we will likely lose it. I'm not finished. The vine growers took his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned them. Again, he sent another group of slaves, large 
larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. They beat them, they killed, they abused. And listen to what the Lord Jesus said. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, this is God's thinking, God's wisdom. This is God's holding out hope, holding out opportunity. He said, I'll send my son, and surely they will respect my son. Does this sound to you like the gospel? Does this sound to you like Jesus was saying, this is what has happened over and over and over, and God has sent me to you with the appeal that surely they will respect my son. That surely they will. Surely they will not abuse him nor in the process abuse each other. They will not abuse the servants of the Lord. They will not abuse the Son born to our Lord. That Jesus was saying, God has sent me to you with the sense that surely, above all things, they will treat my son with respect. The coming of Jesus Christ is a mark of God's long-suffering patience. You know what I believe? And I'm not just talking about this congregation, this church, this body. I believe if it were not for God's enduring long patience many times that churches would be non-existent on the earth. Amen. Unless we had somehow got hold of the idea that God is so kind to us in spite of our treachery. Our treachery. Sometimes words stick. In spite of the way we are and the way we respond to him and his grace. When Jesus came, it was the mark of God's long-suffering patience. Let me give you an illustration that, from the Old Testament that I really believe. God called Noah and his three sons and their wives into the ark, remember? And the scripture says that God shut them in. But a careful reading of that passage tells me that it was days before the rain came. And Peter, in opening a knot hole in that old ark, I hope it was above the water line, uh, looked in and said that Jesus Christ, by his power, by the Spirit of God, preached to those imprisoned spirits because of their disobedience. Have you ever known Christians to be disobedient? Have you ever been? I suspect that every honest person here has to raise our hand and say guilty. Right? Guilty. Guilty. Before we judge another partially, we must confess our own sin. Have you ever sinned? Have you ever broken God's law? It's obvious when, when you put our lives beside 
the Ten Commandments, there were not ten suggestions, they were commandments, remember? That we have all sinned, every single one of us, preachers, deacons, teachers, everybody. There is none righteous, no, not one. We've all failed. We're all guilty. And therefore, since we're all guilty, Jesus coming to the earth was an act of God's grace. And he said, surely, surely, they'll respect my son. Look at verse 40. Well, let's look at 39 first, 38 first. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and seize his inheritance. When people begin to think that this church belongs to them, or any portion of it belongs to them, they're mistreating the Lord. And in my mind, they're sinning. I think the Lord would confirm that. Will you allow me that? It does not belong to us. And if we assume by abusing the will of the Lord Jesus and the love of the Lord Jesus in assuming something to be ours that is not, it's pretty obvious that that's sin. Verse 40 says, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, notice how Jesus teaches with questions. Isn't this a wonderful uh, technique? Those of you who have been teachers a long time, it's a wonderful way to teach. He's told the story. He's flown the guilty flag over all of them. And now he says, what will he do to those vine 